Okay, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank and acknowledge uh, Charles Birnbaum uh, and your colleagues for organizing this event, but also for all of the good work that you've done uh, promoting cultural landscapes, both historically and now looking prospectively. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna try and stick to what Charles told me to do. Uh, which was to speak about metropolitan transformations. Uh, but he really pushed me to cast that in a very personal light in terms of um, how I came into the field and various influences. And um, that's an almost impossible thing to do because I, 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 if I made a list of all the influences, I'm a very eclectic uh, list, literally probably hundreds of, of, of influences. But perhaps along the lines of um, thinking about urbanism and thinking about uh, metropolitan scales of work and what you uh, asked for in your brief, which is how the profession is responding to increased complexity in the field with regards to increasingly complex uh, site situations and uh, contextual scale uh, issues, etc. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. And it kind of begins in Manchester, where I was sort of grew up near Manchester um, in England. And, um, uh, you know, Manchester is a bit of an industrial city, Julie. And I, I you know, had a tough sort of uh, uh, environment in, in, in this juxtaposition between a city transitioning from industry to new, uh, new economies in the 1980s. A tough city, you've got to look after yourself and uh, know how to fight back. Um, Counterculture, the Smiths, they were my friends at the time and uh, it produced some great music, a great club scene, soccer of course, and also a city of fashion, art and music, even in the early, uh, late 1970s and early 1980s. There's a profound sense of a kind of culture, counter-cultural sense of music and fashion and art. Juxtaposed to that was a, a place just north of Manchester called the Lake District, where I went basically every weekend to hike and camp and rock climb and mess around in nature. And this big sort of juxtaposition between, you know, the sort of density and toughness of the city against the weather-bound, uh, atmospherics and scale and drama of these very large natural landscapes, you know, it's still with me as a sort of very strong uh, pairing. Uh, kind of scenic landscapes, but at the same time, you know, for me it was much more about the, um, the sort of scale and the weather and the way in which uh, they influenced your sense of place and your sense of psyche. And then I went to school. I chose landscape architecture as a field because in England you, you do these matrix charts with um, um, subjects that are interesting to you and then the matrix tells you what you should do. So I was very interested in, in geography, biology and art. And it led me to land surveying, cartography, environmental science, or this thing called landscape architecture. So I thought, well, that sounds good. But I really didn't know what I was getting into. And I must admit that uh, I came to the field in a fairly pragmatic and feet on the ground sort of perspective. It took me three years of a fairly um, intense art and design uh, educational environment to get to this, for example. Um, which really pushed, pushed me with regards to conceptual thought and um, um, uh, uh, formal issues about making. And some of, the, some of the abstraction that's required for you to step out of the constraints of uh, being super pra pragmatic and, and being able to think out of the box. Uh, and, and other things. Now, then I got my first job. And um, this was with Richard Rogers and Partners in London for the Royal Docks. I was an intern at the time, so I knew nothing. But it appeared to me that uh, no one else knew anything either. <laughs> that uh, this was the Royal Docks in um, uh, south of London. It was once, you know, a big industrial machine, now derelict and abandoned. It was about 1983, 1982, 1983. 
And um, Roger's office was tasked with creating a master plan for new urban development, which was to include buildings, new infrastructure, and new public spaces, and create a new uh, urban center. Um, nobody knew what to do. The architects could only look at the buildings, and that, to be fair, that's all that their training had been about. Uh, a lot of the educational system in England at the time was about looking at houses or, or, or smaller buildings as part of an architect's education. Um, all the landscape architects knew what to do was put trees everywhere, so they did renderings with trees everywhere. All the uh, environmentalists knew what to do was to look for some bird habitat somewhere, put a big circle around it and say, preserve at all costs. And all the traffic engineer knew what to do was to move traffic in and out, 10,000 cars an hour at peak time, with massive parking demand. And there was no conductor, there was no orchestrator, there was no synthesis capable of understanding building issues, real estate issues, infrastructural issues, public realm issues, environmental issues. Not necessarily being an expert on all of those things, but being sufficient of a generalist to be able to help orchestrate, help synthesize a more intelligent approach. This is the Royal Docks today. Um, some of it's from the Rogers plan, but it's a fairly sad um, vestige today. Uh, it's got some dinky houses in the top which seem completely out of scale, a massive exhibition center which is fine when it's working, and when it's not, it's, it's a very abandoned and, and, and dislocated place. So I came to Penn to study with McCarg, who was a huge influence on me, um, largely because of his personality and his sort of um, his, uh, his, his whole shtick. Um, but also, I mean, design with nature, you know, I ha actually had not read it until I came to Penn. Um, the sort of message in design with nature and introducing me to things like um, uh, uh, Bookminster Fuller's Energy World Map here. You know, what was great about McCarg was that it wasn't just parks and gardens, it was big stuff, and it really had to do with um, the landscape architecture, that landscape architect playing a stronger role in terms of environmental politics and environmental issues at a very large scale. The stuff itself kind of blew my mind for a bit. Um, the, just, the, just being able to look at regional scale work. Um, and, but one of the things there was this scaling idea, working from very large scale to mid-scale to a smaller scale. So the idea of nesting uh, your work across various scales. Um, the whole mapping stuff, of course, but also the science and the technology or the understanding a greater layer level of, in terms of how natural systems work at, at, across these scales. And famously, the um, layering approach or the idea that you could analyze these landscapes in terms of layers, you could attribute values to those layers, you could begin to do rational urbanization planning, rational metropolitan transformation, if you will, in a fairly rational and analytic way. At the same time, 1983, 1984, 1985, I was sort of blown away by this project, um, the Lavalette schemes, both uh, Bernard Schumi's scheme and um, OMA's scheme, uh, working with layers, but these layers this time were not analytic, they were not descriptive, they were actually projective. There was a certain uh, autonomy to them. They didn't derive from the site, they actually derived from a future program. Um, and I guess what sort of very impressed me at the time was I, there were 500 entries to this competition. The entries took the form of either looking modern, they were grid-like or strip-like, or looking pastoral, they were curvilinear and parky. And only Shumi and Coolhouse had a more strategic approach towards using geometry and form to organize program in a prospective and projective way, and to try to work with layering systems in a bid to promote a more heterogeneous mix, a more heterogeneous um, end result. Um, 
And of course, it was cool to see landscape rendered in blue. Uh, and of course, the red follies, and of course, the built work. This scheme was even more influential in some ways. Um, so, you know, I thought that the intelligence of the layers, the way the layers broke apart the program, the way the layers went together to produce a fairly flexible field that was very capable of absorbing different programs and different uses at different times, and putting um, um, people and material and ideas into, into juxtaposition. This was a very powerful ideogram, the whole idea of the montage or the maison scène of, uh, and the juxtaposition of you know, a cornfield against, a, 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 against sand dunes, against a golf course, against a topiary garden, etc. There are other precedents um, that were influential to me throughout the 80s and into the 90s along the same, a similar line of looking at large scale techniques for beginning to organize space and organize program. Um, Broadacre City, of course, fantastic vision, integrating landscape and building and infrastructure. Uh, Le Corbusier's Venice Hospital, a fantastic project um, in terms of beginning to enfold the public realm and uh, open space and architecture as one growing uh, fabric. This is called a mat building, like a sort of a mat. Um, Peter Eisenman did an interpretation of that Venice Hospital which I obsessed with this project for years. I just thought it was fascinating in terms of his interpretation of Le Corbusier's work, but also the projection of these new, um, uh, this new terrain that was sort of integrative, a, a topography, if you will, that was integrative of building and landscape. You couldn't really see figure ground anymore. It wasn't really about buildings and landscape. It was more about a sort of integrated uh, topography. And a little later uh, in Eisenman's work, the possibility of layering in order to produce uh, representational content, what he called archaeologies. So the layers now were not simply analytic as they were with McCarg. They were not simply projective perspective as they were with, say, Schumi and Coolhouse. They now had archaeological content and were beginning to uh, create a possibility of, of reading and misreading. But again, a total breakdown and a dissolution of the typical figure ground configuration into a new sort of thick mat. Uh, Alison and Peter Smithson's work in the 60s and 70s, very powerful in terms of, again, looking at the city, not as buildings and open spaces, but as a network or as a milieu. Um, uh, Constance work with the situationists, these wonderful sorts of drawings about how you experience the city as a sort of stroller and detour, the whole uh, Louis Kahn map, these sort of other maps of the city that you don't necessarily see, but they are the infrastructure or the diagram that allows a city to function, allows the city to work. And of course that led to certain things I did in the early 1990s looking at the American landscape and trying to understand how as a surface and how as a, as a metropolitan condition the American landscape has been shaped, has been laid out, has been surveyed, what sorts of tools and techniques and metrics were played out in order to allow the American landscape to grow and to become uh, what it is today. So the grid system of course is still super fascinating in terms of the way it enabled the settlement and the building out of the American landscape. And, you know, from the air, looking down, you can't help but see layers and palimpsests and uh, the historical traces of previous times w interfacing with current work. Uh, Julie was talking about a working landscape in a sense this idea that work on the landscape leaves traces and these traces become overlaid and accrued over time is very evident from the air and these sorts of images are very uh, provocative. And of course the work of Robert, uh, of um, Rauschenberg um, 
The fact that he works in what he calls a flatbed fashion. He's a painter who doesn't paint with the canvas vertically, but he paints with the canvas flat. Uh, he works around all sides. It has no top or bottom. And for Rauschenberg, as for a number of other artists of his generation, it isn't about painting as representation, it's about painting as work. And the work leaves its own trace. So the actual work of working with pigment or working with collage is the work itself. It doesn't represent anything. It's not about uh, pictorialism. It's about a flatbed of work that leaves its own traces. You look at Rome, I was very influenced by Colin Rowe and Collage City, and the idea of a, of a fabric that grows in an incremental way. So almost everything I showed up until this point was about uh, an organizational approach towards planning and design that's extensive. It's a big system that you put down. But uh, what Colin Rowe and Collage City, you learn about the way certain cities grow in a more aggre ag aggregative or incremental way. And uh, he has a wonderful phrase that he calls the interst interstitial debris, which is actually the space in between. And so that leads to a potential extension of an interest from surfaces into aggregates, where aggregates begin to add in multiple and grow and create fields or create uh, field conditions. The same small multiple growing in time, producing a more extensive mat or a more extensive fabric or more extensive field. And, you know, there's some research to do with little housing prototypes, but you could do the same with any um, unit that has the possibility of repetition, slight variation, and in aggregation it begins to produce a larger uh, sense of space and organization. You could say bottom up rather than top down, because these small units are very easily manageable and they're easily grown and they're easily um, replicated. And finally, you get to the biological moment where this idea about surface and geometry, the organization of surfaces um, from mapping to layout to aggregation to the idea of a surface that's biologically living and is um, self-regulating in some way. So this image is an image of sweat glands. Uh, the silvery blue is a globule of water or sweat. If the skin is really hot, those globules will get bigger and there'll be more of them uh, to try to cool the skin down. When the skin goes cooler and goes cold, the sweat will disappear. So this idea of a, uh, of a surface that's, whose formal properties now are actually linked to its process. So beginning to understand form and process as something that's performative in time. So that's a really shorthand version of a lot of stuff, but to try to bring it to um, the metropolitan condition, you know, I'm trying to show how I've had for a very long time a deep interest in uh, horizontal systems of organization. You could call it planning. Um, some of those interests are analytic and descriptive, and, and in particular to do with describing the interrelational layers, the interrelational processes, a la Macog. Some are projective and autonomous, completely autonomous, and more about creating new situations or projecting new programs such as uh, the work at Lavalette. Um, some have to do with blending and folding and uh, working more with to topography, where building an open space and network systems become one synthesis, as in, say, Lavalette, but also Le Corbusier at Ven Venice or some of the Eisen early Eisenman work. Some archaeological and palimpsest-like in terms of being able to have layers of um, content, uh, layers of archaeology, as in some of the Eisenman examples. Some super pragmatic and just more like an engineering uh, monolith, as in certain parts of the American landscape, which are just really 
extraordinarily pragmatic landscapes and pragmatic geometries. Some time-based um, uh, systems of organization um, that allow things to evolve and change in time. Um, some organizations that are born not from extension but from accretion of small aggregates or small units in time. A forest is a perfectly good example of something that is grown, uh, grown up out of small aggregates. So the current tension that you see in, in many debates today between form and process to me is sort of, you know, it's not one-sided. You don't say, oh, I'm all about form, I don't care about process. You don't say, I'm all about process, I don't care about form. The two are absolutely interrelated. It's the precision of, and the detailing of the form that allows and guides and steers processes to be able to behave and interact in certain ways. So form and process are absolutely interrelated. This stuff, I think, isn't just intellectual or conceptual or, um, or sort of um, um, sidebar. I think they're pretty fundamental concepts for beginning to think about how we can deal with cities today and how we can deal with um, many of the complex sites that Julie has pointed out are abundant, many of them post-industrial conditions that don't have easy solutions, and the whole problem of how to organize them, how to organize content, and how to begin to use form and geometry to organize process in time is a pretty key, uh, pretty key issue. So looking back very quickly, in Downsview Park 12 years ago, this whole project was just about using earthwork to steer water to begin to build and diversify um, um, the ecological range and the social programming range of a fairly bereft site. Um, and setting that strategy into time in terms of four uh, build-out phases on a two-year cycle. The same at Fresh Kills Park. Many of you know this project, but four square miles of totally ecologically bereft land with uh, very sterile soil and a desire to somehow make this into a new public park. How do you do it? It's a massive, massive scale project. Um, so rather than designing a master plan and designing uh, something that resembles a park, we actually tried to design a process a process that could be layered, and those layers could produce a sort of uh, series of techniques around which the landscape could begin to grow over time and self-evolve and self-emerge. Um, with uh, uh, soil making ideas, tree planting ideas, and staging and phasing ideas on a critical path in terms of how this landscape could grow over time. Um, and eventually, you know, beginning to make more places within it. But the main thing was the design of a method. Project I just want to take three minutes on. I know someone put up a sign, but give me, give me a few minutes. Um, is this one in China? Just because it's sort of uh, a massive project that Field Operations is leading. It's a city for two million people. We won this competition against um, firms like Foster and OMA. Uh, it's for a city and involves buildings and streets and infrastructure, but our whole uh, basis for th um, uh, developing this scheme is around the landscape and around the um, environment around which this city could grow. Um, it's just to the uh, west of Shenzhen. Shenzhen is looking to move its district to the coast. This is the site. If you overlaid the site on Manhattan, it's that big. They want it built out in 10 years. So the first problem is how do you organize and break up the site? So we took five uh, streams that are all polluted at the moment, but they become the big armatures for organizing the site. Uh, but they're designed to be super wide. They're uh, several hundred meters wide, a couple of kilometers long. They actually become water machines, big biological landscapes. Uh, the water from the surrounding lands and from the urban development goes into these machines where the water is retained and uh, processed before going into the bay. And at the same time, the fingers become great parks 
They're also designed to have uh, paths and fields and surfaces and amphitheaters. So as a sculptural design, um, the design is not only sculpted for aesthetic reasons, but also in terms of how the hydrology of these, of these fingers works. And then they begin to get developed and uh, st stroke through, and then the system itself gets worked out. And that these then become the central parks for the new city. Not a central uh, park as a big rectangle, but linear fingers of recreational uses on the edges and water-based uh, functions in, the, in their centers. And then in relationship to that, the five districts. One of the problems in China is they tend to build very big blocks. So we define a new block building system for them that has to do with working with much smaller units, much smaller block structures, and forcing, therefore, a much more textural and much more mixed form of building to begin to occur rather than mega blocks surrounded by typically eight to 12 lane roads. And then even within a block, the block starts to begin uh, to be developed and worked. And then we have these codes. Now again, I just wanted to make the point here that this is a little bit like a forestry management diagram to me. <laughs> Instead of mapping out species of trees in time, we're actually mapping out how the building should begin to be uh, built and grow in time to begin to build the fabric. So it's a fairly ambitious project, uh, it's happening, it's very exciting, but what is really cool is the landscape is being built first. It's the landscape infrastructure that they've agreed to build first, not the, not the, uh, not the roads and the buildings, and then the landscape will come later. But as the, as, the, as the thing that comes first to bring quality and to bring control to the, um, to the uh, site. Uh, I was going to talk about the High Line, but I'm being told to stop. Um, and I just will say one thing about the High Line. That, oh, there's sustainability stuff down there. Um, how does the High Line relate to all of this? Well, one way it relates is that, in many ways, it was conceived as an organizational system. Um, sure, there are places. The places have tactility and there's a lot of design and attention to detail and craft as to how places are made. But first and foremost, with regards to a respect for what we found on the High Line, the initial response, given the tightness of dimension and the need to create a path, was how to build a system that would be a little bit like a railroad engineering mentality in terms of how that system could be reproduced and could play out flexibly across the length of the line. So this uh, paving system actually has a lot of thought behind it in terms of how it's made and how it works and how it offers flexibility in different locations and responds to different things, but allows at the same time for this sense of self-similarity to remain, and then the actual technology of that in terms of uh, having permeable joints or open joints where we can collect the rainwater and allow the rainwater to begin to irrigate the planting beds, and some of the techniques and technology around which that surface gets made. So in many ways, even at a smaller scale of work, the whole idea of thinking about horizontal schemes of organization, the construction of those surfaces, and then how those surfaces channel people and channel water and channel uh, forces and get built. That's a really good image to end on. How that actual surface gets built is part of, the, um, part, part of our interest. So sorry for running on a little bit, a lot to pack in, but uh, there you go. Thank you.